Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to attend the, the workshop. Um, my name is Constantine, and uh, I, I work in Sacramento for a law firm that does a lot of work with public agencies, and we act as uh, public financing attorneys, bond counsel uh, for those public agencies. So one of the interesting things that I'd like to talk to you today is about the in enhanced infrastructure financing districts. And I'll, t I'll talk about how to establish them, what they can do, some of the ideas that we're thinking about, and then Aaron will, will uh, deliver a, a real-world case study about infrastructure financing districts. Okay. Um, as a brief introduction, um, EFIDs provides for the creation of something which is going to be called a independent financing authority. It's going to be called a public financing authority. Um, this authority is going to implement something that's going to be called the infrastructure financing plan. It's going to provide for the uh, issuance of bonds. The formation process is patterned similar to the Melarus Community Facilities Act. So a lot of the things which you see in the Melarus Code are going to be used again in the uh, EIFD world. Um, you're going to define the area of the district. Uh, you adopt many of the same resolutions as you would when you form a CFD. Um, briefly, the EIFD is designed to fund a wide variety of facilities uh, using the property tax increment from the property taxing, participating taxing entities that voluntarily agree to participate. Um, property tax comes in basically two forms. One is from the increase in property tax revenues collected from the, within the boundaries of the area that you define. And the other is from the property tax revenue received from the state to backfill the local tax revenue losses resulting from the uh, reduction in the state vehicle license fee. In addition to tax increments, um, we have about 10 different other sources of funding. Um, we then have assessments, you can look at those. You can look at loans, uh, user fees for some of the infrastructure that you're gonna build. If you can build something with a revenue generating source, you can tap into that as well. Um, you also wanna consider grants, and you also wanna consider developer contributions, private equity. Um, and then as this presentation continues, I'm gonna be using the term called bundling. That's developed into a pretty key word in the EIFD world because by itself, tax increment is gonna take a long, not take a long, long time, but take time to spool up. So you're gonna to have to look at other revenue sources to fill the gap in the interim. Let's talk about the formation process. Process can be only initiated by the city or county. So it's the city or county which is going to adopt the resolution of intention. And from then forward, the public financing authority is going to run the show. Okay, the public financing authority is going to be established at the time the resolution of intention is adopted. In a resolution of intention, you're going to find the proposed facilities, um, and then you're going to direct the preparation of the IFD plan. Now, a vote of the population is not going to be required to form the IFD, um, and so the EIFD may exist without a vote of the population. And also the size of the EIFD. Um, as these programs are being rolled out, a lot of municipalities are wondering how large, how small the EIFD boundary is supposed to be. Well, it's really gonna depend, I think, on what type of investment program you're going to, de you're developing. That's probably going to drive the size of the EIFD. Now what is the IFD plan that I mentioned before? That's the heart of the EIFD. It's going to specify what type of facilities are going to be financed. It's going to specify which entities will be contributing their tax increment and in what amounts. Um, it's also going to lay out what other revenue sources are available. Taxes, fees, grants, and loans. The amounts contributed by the other taxing entities to the EIFD need not be the same, doesn't have to be uniform, can change over time. Um, the plan also defines when the EIFD is going to cease to exist, and the statutes state that the EIFD can exist up to 45 years from the date of approval by the voters of the issues of the bonds, Now, and, and also approval of some loans. So in theory, the EIFD can exist for much longer than 45 years 
if you delay or never ask your voters to approve bonds. So the idea is, is that the EIFD can, can chug along providing tax increment to fund different programs for, 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 for a very, very long time. Some of the facilities which may be funded. Well, you're looking at really an unprecedented array of facilities. You can build probably nearly every single type of facility um, that you can think of, as long as there's something of community-wide significance. <coughs> Transportation, water, flood control, stormwater management, um, energy, environmental mitigation, transit priority projects, uh, acquisition repair, construction of industrial structures for private use. Um, facilities need not be located within the district, as long as there is tangible connection to the work of the district, so you can look at more regional types of infrastructure. In addition, very low to low moderate income housing is authorized, but not mandatory. And broadband is also allowed. Uh, public hearing requirement. Okay, so let's back up. We've adopted a resolution of intention. We've asked for the preparation of the IFD plan. And now we come to the public hearing requirement. Right before you get the, pub the public hearing requirement, you have to have the IFD plan has to be completed, it's got to be circulated, it has to be consented to and approved by the participating taxing entities. Um, although the city or the county which initiates the EIFD process, the EIFD may include a variety of other taxing entities with the exception of school districts and they can all contribute a portion of the tax increment. So once the taxing entities are all on board, the Public Financing Authority will hold a public hearing. Once the hearing is completed, the resolution of formation is adopted. Once the resolution of formation is adopted, your EIFD is created. Okay, let's talk about governance of the EIFD. Now the EIFD is going to be governed by a legislative body. It's a new body that's going to be established called the Public Financing Authority. Now this authority is going to be comprised, if you have one taxing entity participating, of three members of the legislative body of the participating taxing entity and at least two members of the public. Now if you have multiple taxing entities, then the membership on the public side will consist, the membership of the public financing authority, a majority of that membership will consist of folks from the legislative bodies of the participating taxing entities and then two members of the public, at least. So if you're going to include multi-jurisdictional uh, entities, uh, you gotta think strategically. You gotta make sure that the people that you, the entities that you wanna participate can all get along with one another. Otherwise, you're gonna be setting yourself up and be designing a structure that's gonna become unworkable from the very beginning, so that's important. Um, issuance of bonds. Now, the voter approval is required to have the bonds be issued. That approval rate is 55%. Now, depending upon the amount of registered voters within the boundaries of the EIFD, um, the vote may either be by the landowners or by the, by the registered voters. If you're lucky enough to have less than 12 registered voters, then you can get a landowner election. If you have a landowner, landowner election, and you can get waivers, then the election process is condensed. If you have registered voters, then the election process is expanded. And then you probably need to engage in some type of voter education program in order to um, tell the voters your story, tell them this is the investment program, this is why it will help the area that you live in. Um, in order to issue bonds, uh, the tax revenues that are going to fund bonds are going to be tax increments. But like I mentioned before, it's gonna take time for those tax increments to spool up. So you're gonna to have to look at other revenue sources. Um, and then, the uh, idea that we're looking at is the possibility of using uh, a CFD as an overlay over the EIFD. Um, so you form the EIFD and you establish your CFD over the same area, and a portion of the CFD special taxes could in theory be paid by tax increments. It's an idea. So the tax, the EIFD will feed your CFD for a period of time. And since the CFD bonds are commonly recognized by the investment community, it may be easier to underwrite those 
rather than being the first municipality out the gate that's going to be selling EIFD bonds. It's just a thought. Um, certain things that must be done before the EIFD process begins. Well, fortunately, the EIFD law provides for the boundaries to overlap those of former redevelopment agencies. That's important. Um, the successor agency to the city or county participating in the process must have received the finding of completion from the Department of Finance. Um, city or county certifies that no former redevelopment agency assets which are proposed to benefit the EIFD are subject to litigation involving the state. So is there a possibility that certain assets that are not involved with this EIFD may still be subject to litigation. Also, the state controller needs to complete this review of post-20, January 2011 transfers and the agency must be, com com must be complying with those findings. Some of the uh, basic differences between the RDA and the EIFD. Um, well, under the RDA law, uh, when a city or county established that an area was blighted, uh, and, I'm, and I'm really compressing it, um, basically the redevelop redevelopment agency was formed and tax increment was allocated to that redevelopment agency. In the EIFD world, it's all voluntary. Taxing entities have to agree to participate. Um, there is no finding of blight in the EIFD world. You don't have to go through that. Um, unlike an RDA, EIFDs do not have the broad power of eminent domain. Although they, they do have a little bit of eminent domain power under the Polanco Act and the Gatto Act, they don't have the eminent domain powers that redevelopment agencies used to have. In addition, EFI, EIFDs may finance the acquisition of real property, but they can't acquire property in their own name, at least not yet. Um, and in regards to bonds, oh, and then funds may be expended outside the district, um, as long as there is a connection to the work of the district. So you can look at regional, regional projects. You don't have to uh, kind of put everything within your boundaries. And, and be limited by that. Housing, mm -hmm. um, like I mentioned before, there's no mandatory housing expenditure requirement for EIFDs. Um, however, if you're gonna finance any housing by the EIF, EIFD, if that's part of your investment program, well then you're gonna have to be limited to um, very low, low to moderate income housing restrictions. And then any housing that's destroyed in the course of the EIFD program, either as a result of public works um, or by private development that has an agreement uh, with the public agency, then that has to be replaced uh, within two years. Um, go ahead, time. Okay. So I guess that's that's. That's it for the formation process of the EIFD. And in summary, I, I think one of the biggest things about this new program is that its ability to unite a variety of, of jurisdictions under one umbrella. That's probably the biggest take home message from the EIFD um, statutes. Uh, if done correctly, you can do projects across a, a, a wide territory and uh, create a pretty good platform to, con to continue the, the investment program for many years to come. Thank you.